Hi, I'm Emily Towner, and today I'm going to be talking about my first year report, which is entitled Learning and Adolescence, Social and Affective Influences. So adolescence, or the period of life between 10 to 24 years, is a time of emotional, social, and neural development. It's also a time when adolescents are learning a great deal through formal education and from their increasingly complex social and emotional worlds. Development and learning are intricately entwined. Both learning and normative development can generate rewiring of neural circuits. An enhanced learning might constitute evidence for a sensitive period or a period of development in which the environment can exert a particularly strong influence on brain and behavior. In specific domains, this would mean that learning is easier, more effective, and more enduring at certain times. So for example, while enhanced learning of sensory information in infancy represents a sensitive period in that domain, enhanced social and emotional learning might indicate a sensitive period in that domain during adolescence. So in order to explore adolescence as a sensitive period of development, my research aims to investigate how adolescents learn. So how is learning different during this period and what do we know so far? We know that adolescents are particularly sensitive to rewards and there is an adolescent peak in reward related brain activity. And in this graph, you can see that in both, both the left and the right nucleus accumbens, which is a main component of the ventral striatum, a, re a region consistently identified in reward processing, there's a peak in reward related activity, which is plotted on the y axis, during adolescence, which is plotted on the x axis. Further, Increased connectivity between reward regions of the brain and the hippocampus, which is a structure critical for learning and memory, has been associated with better learning, specifically in adolescence. Behaviorally, it's less clear how reward sensitivity affects reward learning, but reversal learning, which is the ability to shift outcome expectancies when contingencies change, has been found to be enhanced during adolescence in both human and animal studies. And it's thought that this reversal learning is primarily driven by a sensitivity to rewards. Adolescents also show differences in their sensitivity to threats, particularly in how they process and learn from threats. Mid-adolescents show increased activity in the amygdala to fearful faces. And in this graph, you can see age on the x-axis and neural signal in the amygdala on the y-axis. And adolescents are represented by these dark circles. Further, learned fear associations seem to be particularly robust during adolescence. Adolescents show reduced extinction compared to both juveniles and adults. And in this graph, you can see that this extinction learning is markedly reduced in both human adolescents as measured by skin conductance and in adolescent rodents as measured by freezing behavior at postnatal day 29. However, it's important to note that there are relatively few studies in humans investigating this effect. In addition to rewards and threats, research has shown that adolescents show elevated sensitivity to all social stimuli positive and negative. For example, you can see here that teens have elevated signal change in the ventral striatum when looking at happy faces compared to children and adults. Therefore, learning might be altered by social context and social content during adolescence. And one social context that I'm particularly interested in is when social needs are not being met. For example, how is learning affected by social isolation in adolescence? And this brings me to the aims of my PhD, in which I hope to answer three questions. Question one, how does social isolation affect learning in adolescence? Question two, are there differences in fear extinction learning and or retention in adolescents compared with both children and adults? And question three, do adolescents preferentially remember and recall social versus non-social information? So in order to address question one, I will describe the social isolation study, which is currently in progress. Starting with a bit of background, 
studies have shown that 16 to 24 year olds report the highest levels of loneliness. And in rodents, adolescent social isolation heightens sensitivity to social rewards and impairs reversal learning. And in this top graph, you can see that isolated adolescent rodents chose more frequent social opportunities, indicating that they found these opportunities more rewarding. And in this bottom graph, you can see that isolated adolescent rodents took significantly more sessions to successfully learn a contingency reversal than those housed socially. And also in rodents, adolescent social isolation has been found to increase anxiety behavior and impair fear extinction learning. And in this graph, you can see that the learned fear, which is evidenced by this differential response to the conditioned stimulus, remained after extinction only in those rodents who were socially isolated. To expand this research to humans, I sought to answer four main questions. First, how does isolation affect fear learning and reward learning in adolescence? Do adolescents learn better from rewarding social versus non-social feedback? And is this affected by isolation? Can virtual social interactions remediate these effects? And do functional and structural brain markers predict individual differences in these effects? This study also seeks to answer several other questions and full details can be found in the pre-registration on OSF, including specific directional hypotheses. So how am I studying this? I aim to recruit 40 participants aged 16 to 19 years. I'm using a within subjects design and as of today, August 2nd, data has been collected from 21 participants, which is over half of our intended sample. So participants come into the lab for three sessions, starting with a baseline session. Prior to the baseline session, participants are free to interact socially, both virtually and in person. They then undergo a series of structural and functional MRI scans before coming to our behavioral lab to undergo a series of questionnaires, computerized tasks, and physiology recordings of their electrodermal activity or their sweat response. And the session is guided by a researcher. Following the baseline session, participants complete two further sessions which are counterbalanced in order across participants. During the isolation with media session, Participants spend three to four hours in a furnished, comfortable room in the psychology department with access to games, snacks, drinks, et cetera. They are allowed to engage in virtual social interactions during this session, but they do not have any in-person social interactions. They then self-administer the same questionnaires, computerized tasks, and physiology recordings as in the baseline session. And participants are provided with detailed instructions for how to complete the session. Finally, during the total isolation session, participants follow the same protocol as in the isolation with media session, but during the three to four hour isolation period, they are also banned from engaging in any virtual social interactions or with social materials like novels, photos, etc. So now I'll tell you a bit about how I'm quantifying and measuring my constructs of interest, starting with the behavioral measures. To measure reward learning, I'm using a reinforcement learning task. Participants are presented with two slot machines and they learn which slot pays out more through trial and error. After several trials, the contingencies reverse and participants must learn new contingencies. There are two conditions in this task separated into two counterbalanced blocks, a social and a non-social feedback condition. In the non-social feedback condition, when participants win, they are presented with a plus sign and a zero when they do not win. In the social feedback condition, participants are presented with a smiling face when they win and a neutral face when they do not win. And to quantify reinforcement learning, I am using a reinforcement learning model with several parameters, including a learning rate and a perseveration rate. To measure fear learning, I'm using a Pavlovian fear conditioning task. And in this task, participants are presented with two neutral shapes, one of which is accompanied by a loud aversive sound and participants learn to associate one of the shapes with the aversive stimulus. Participants experience three phases of this task, acquisition, extinction, and retention. During acquisition, participants initially learn the associations. During extinction, participants are presented both shapes without the aversive sound, and participants learn to extinguish the fear response to the previously conditioned stimulus.
Finally, after a 10 minute break, extinction retention is assessed using the same task without the aversive sound. And to quantify fear learning, I'm using two methods, skin conductance and self-report. Skin conductance is measured using two small electrodes attached to the participant's fingers and is quantified by the amplitude of the skin conductance response. I will look at differences in the average amplitude of model-based skin conductance responses to each shape. Secondly, I will assess differences in self-reported arousal and valence ratings to each shape. Moving on to neural measures, I will measure reward sensitivity using functional MRI during a monetary incentive delay task where particip participants are presented with cues that represent either large or small wins or losses. And participants have to respond within a certain time frame, and if successful, they can either win or avoid a loss. To quantify reward sensitivity, I will calculate the average response magnitude from each region of interest for the reward anticipation versus neutral anticipation contrast. And regions of interest include the ventral striatum and the anterior cingulate cortex, among others. Here you can see the results from a meta-analysis of functional activation during reward anticipation using the MID task, as well as pilot data from the current study replicating these results. Using structural MRI sequences, I will measure whole brain white matter volume, whole brain gray matter volume, cortical thickness and surface area, and cortical gray matter volume in each lobe. And my analysis plan involves two main parts. First, to investigate the impact of isolation, I will compare reward and fear learning within participants between sessions. Second, to investigate brain markers of individual differences, I will test whether we can predict the effects of isolation on reward and fear learning from our functional and structural brain measures. And there's a more detailed explanation of the analysis plan in the pre-registration and also in my written report. And I'm happy to discuss more after the presentation if anyone is interested. Now I'll move on to discuss further aims of my PhD, which I will very briefly describe. So the second aim of my PhD is to answer the following question. Are there differences in fear extinction learning and or retention in adolescents compared with both children and adults? So I've already discussed a bit about how fear extinction seems to be different in adolescents compared to children and adults. But to reiterate, studies have shown an adolescent reduction in diminishing learned fear response and retaining that attenuation long-term. However, there are relatively few human studies with conflicting findings. And as fear learning is fundamentally related to the development of anxiety disorders, Differences in fear learning and extinction could be an adolescent vulnerability for anxiety and mental health disorders. Further, this is important because fear extinction learning is a critical part of exposure therapy. So in order to systematically address prior research investigating this question, I've been working on a systematic review of fear learning in adolescents, and I hypothesize that adolescents will show heightened conditioned fear during and after extinction compared to adults, indicating impaired fear extinction learning and or retention. And I'm conducting a systematic review and meta-analysis using the NERO guidelines. The NERO guidelines are for non-interventional, reproducible, and open systematic reviews and are based on PRISMA. And for this, I have published a pre-registered protocol on the open science framework. Finally, the last aim of my PhD is to answer this question. Do adolescents preferentially remember and recall social versus non-social information? So people tend to recall a higher proportion of specific personal events from the ages of 10 to 30 years than from any other time in life. And in this graph, you can see a large spike in percentage of memories recalled spanning the decades from the teens to the 20s. And this adolescent young adult reminiscence bump can be partially accounted for by the fact that many novel and important life events take place during this period that ultimately shape one's identity. However, developing neural system and systems and cognitive abilities may also contribute. Further, brain regions involved in social cognition undergo structural and functional changes during adolescence, as does the hippocampus 
which is a structure critical in supporting episodic memory. And you can see in this graph that the volume of the right hippocampus plotted on the y-axis increases steadily in both males and females across the adolescent period plotted on the x-axis. However, it is still unclear how adolescents learn and remember social relative to non-social information and whether social memory may contribute to the reminiscence bump we see during this developmental period. To investigate this question, I will conduct an empirical study, which is currently in planning stages. And I hypothesize that adolescents will display heightened memory for social versus non-social information relative to, to adults. And I will carry out an empirical study with 150 participants, 50 adolescents aged 11 to 17, 50 emerging adults aged 18 to 24, and 50 young adults aged 25 to 35. We will do this using a computerized memory task. And this study is in the planning phases and the writing of a pre-registration is in progress. So in conclusion, adolescence is a transformative period of life characterized by substantial changes in one's social and emotional environment. And it is a critical time for learning. Importantly, learning is related to mental health disorders, which often onset in adolescence and have lifelong consequences for well-being. For example, fear extinction is critical for regulating anxiety, and studies have found reduced reward learning in individuals with depression, among other mental health disorders. Finally, learning can be a point of intervention, with some of the most effective evidence-based treatments like exposure therapy targeting learning mechanisms. However, before we attempt to use learning as a target of intervention, we must understand how the changing social and emotional sensitivity in adolescence might influence learning so we can potentially begin to get at causal mechanisms that will influence research and treatment. Thank you.